This is Kelly from Watch the Obsession. Thank you so much for taking time to watch this video. Please take a moment to click like and subscribe and we hope to see you again. This video is going to cover the first interviews with the mothers of each of the victims. And the only of the victims' mothers who I could not find a first interview for is Madison Mogan's mother. So what you're watching right now is from when Madison Mogan's family and friends all got matching tattoos in her memory, which I think is very sweet. And I think you can tell by the looks on their faces that this was a healing moment for everybody that was involved. So the interviews that you're going to hear are with Kelly Gonsalves' mother, Zana Kernodal's mother, and also the first interview with Ethan Chapin's mother. Please leave a comment below after you watch the video and let us know what you think. We all want to know what you think. Some of you were looking for the original recording that had Kelly's mother saying to Kelly's sister, Olivia, in the beginning, we've got to get this right. Don't get mad. Apparently, this was quickly cut off of the footage that was available through the media, but I do have the original recording that came out right after this was recorded. So for those of you who wanted to see it, here it is. So we can notice here that Kaylee's sister is noticeably annoyed and hey man, who can blame her? She just lost her sister about a week ago, but there are some interesting things to observe in this small little snippet from this interview. So for all of you, please hit like and subscribe and that bell for future notifications. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Christy Gonsalves, K-R-I-S-T-I-G-O-N-C-A-L-V-E-S. -E yeah, I'm Olivia Stevenson, A-L-I-V-E-A-S-T-E-V-E-N-S-O-N. -E -E uh, Gonsalves is my maiden name. I'm married. My name is Tammy Butes, T-A-M-I-B-U-T-T-Z. Good. You guys are good? Everybody uh, good? No, I'm here. Which you one? You Oh, there you go. Okay. You got to get it right. Don't get mad. Uh, I think I think we got it on the, the pickup. Good. Um, okay. So, just uh, first off, uh, the map that just came out from police mm -hmm. it gives a little bit of a timeline of where they may have been that night. Does that map mesh up with the timeline that you've been putting together? Yeah, I'd say it's very close. I'd say if you have any closer details to kind of hone in 145 could be very vague maybe it's closer to you know 150 let us know if you have anything concrete because right now concrete's what we can go off of in terms of the details you said it's close mm -hmm. does that frustrate you that, it, that it's close i do but right now we're still trusting authorities that you know it's not going to be 20 minutes here or 15 minutes here that's breaking this um but yeah, I, I implore everyone, if they know something different, bring it to the police, because if they want to tighten up that timeline, um, we stand with that. It seems like there's this very big gap when it comes to Ethan and Zana. Mm -hmm. Do you know where they might have been? I don't, unfortunately. I, I, I know nothing about them. We, know, we, we have no idea where they um, were, but we do have a pretty tight timeline on Kaylee and Maddie, and um, it is close to what they are posting, but... Um, it is a difference, and that difference actually could be huge. I mean, it could be, it could not be. Um, but, you know, 145, 159, um, so there is, and, and, and we have corroborated our, with my phone records, um, Kaylee's phone records, um, uh, the driver that was driving them around. Um, yeah, so you, really have, concrete. you have pulled video seeing the mm -hmm. Uber driver dropping them off. Yes. You've checked your phone records. You know yes. time stamps mm -hmm. what yes. time they got home. Yeah. It's not exactly what police are saying, right? Right. It's not um, 145. Kaylee and Maddie were picked up from their home at 1122 King um, around 1015. It's about a five-minute drive down. So they arrived to Corner Club around 1020, which is different than what was released at 10. Um, we know that Kaylee called for an Uber at 1.45. He arrived at 1.49, got in the car around 1.50. It's about a five, six minute drive. Um, they arrived home at 1.56. Is it frustrating that your, is it frustrating that your timeline is based on 
timestamps from videos and phone records and their timeline doesn't exactly match yours? I just feel like there's a reason they're just putting it out the estimate. I don't know because they do have that information from that from us and they've asked us where we have gotten that information and we have concrete backing. Um, she put it together. Um, um, it could be conflicting stories. We just don't know. This is the information I, that and I, I stand behind. I, I think that when they say 145, I think they're kind of uh, referring to the whole group arriving approximately 145. I believe that maybe Ethan and Zana, and I don't know, may have gotten home around that time. And, and then the girls obviously 159-ish is shortly after. So they're just kind of grouping that the, the group arrived home around 145-ish. Um, but they were not together. And we don't know anything about Ethan and Zana. We do know about Kaylee and Maddie. And, and some of the, the time stamping afterwards, you know, that, you know that your sister was making calls, right? Mm -hmm. She was mm -hmm. making calls as late as almost 2 o'clock. Yes. yes. Uh, how do you know that? Um, so she was on my mom's cell plan. So we pulled my um, cell plan. on Sunday, I was able to pull those cell records. And you could see that she was mm -hmm. calling somebody out. Does, yeah. Does it seem like they, they may have been involved or does it seem like... No, they no, not at all. Uh, no. Kaylee had no shame in, in kind of uh, power calling. So it, it fits Kaylee. Yeah, no, yeah, and we know who she was calling, and this person is, yeah, and, and this person was asleep, unfortunately, um, was not getting the calls, and um, it was, I don't know, a few calls between, for the, for half an hour, she called him a couple times, and, but no, um, it was not, we do not believe she was calling him for help, we were, we believe that she was just calling him to come over, if Kaylee was in, in, in them in, uh, and danger her or your Maddie, they would have called 911. They would not have been calling this person. Yeah. And that was, was that, that was so at, around 2. Yes, yeah, so at that time we Started believe. around 2.30. Yeah, we believe that the girls were just fine. So, the, so, so from those phone records, it looks like the girls may have been alive around 2.30. 2.30 is what, the last mm -hmm. call? Um, no, uh, the last call is shortly before 3 a.m. Sure, yeah, that's right, 2.50 something. 2.52. For yeah. both of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's now been five days. Right. And still, no killer. Still, no motive. Uh, how are you guys holding up? Yeah, I think it's different for everyone. Um, they obviously are, you know, the, the same people to us, but they were different to all of us. Um, to my mom, it was a daughter. To my aunt, they were nieces. To me, they were sisters. Um, and we all had different, you know, very complex and amazing relationships with both of them. So it's going to feel different. Um, empty yeah for all of us. Was just home she just left on friday she left on friday morning to go to a pie fi party and she had just bought a brand new range rover and she just she contemplated all day long back and forth whether she should go home and because she just really wanted to show it to maddie mm -hmm. you know and some other friends and whatnot and she's just like mom i'm gonna go i'm gonna go to the pie fi party and i'm gonna i got maddie's got to see this right my new ride and i'm like for sure like i mean it was nice right. it was really nice she just bought it that day all her own and um and i talked to the girls on um i did she she had a fun time on friday night the both of the girls and then both of the girls texted me on saturday um so, so you were talking to you saturday yeah saturday afternoon yes yeah, saturday afternoon they sent me pictures um of themselves and um gaily called me around 2 30 ish on saturday afternoon and then i started i was texting Kaylee just randomly on sunday um and right about those, when I look back at my times that I was texting Kaylee, the police were swarming. So, so you you were trying to you were trying to get a hold of her on Sunday morning. Yeah, just random, just Unreal. random talking. Yeah. yeah, just hey, you know what's going on? What, right. How did you guys do last night? You know, we we talked a lot. And she was supposed to be home on Tuesday. She said she'd be home on Tuesday. Uh, we, we were talking a little bit earlier, um, but whoever did this is is still out there. Yes. Do you have a message for them? Turn yourself in. Stop. Stop all this. Let us mourn our children. And we can't when we know this person is out there. You know who did it. You you know who you are. Just end it. The guilt has got to be just overwhelming. It's, it's got to no be hiding. sickening. Stop hiding. Stop running. Just turn yourself in. Just turn yourself in so we can move on. We can bury our girls. We can have a celebration of life for them. And continue to mourn and, and try the best to heal, start the healing process. But we can't with this person just running around out there. This person's dangerous. 
And we fear that this person will do this again. Now that he's done it once, or he can definitely do it again. We have no idea why. None. There's no reason why any anyone should have been targeted for any reason. These were young, beautiful children that were starting their lives, and they were successful, and they were go-getters, and they were strong. There's absolutely no reason for jealousy or anything for someone to take for children's lives like this. Turn yourself in. You owe it to these mothers of these children, these fathers, these families. You're wrong. Turn yourself in. You, you said something that um, I've never even thought of, uh, which is, it's almost the worst nightmare, which is, is how do you bury your daughter knowing that they could possibly come? It, yeah, be, yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, it's going to be, the, the services for these girls will be huge, you know, public. Mm -hmm. And to think that this person is sitting, you know, there at the church, just, I can't. You're, you're worried that the killer yeah. might show up to their services. Absolutely. Their candlelight vigils, you know, all of that. It makes me sick that this person could be there, standing right behind us, waving a little candle. You know, it's sickening, absolutely sickening. We're sick, we're just sick. We just wanted to end. It's a living nightmare. Yeah. It's a living nightmare. Now, in, in terms of uh, what police have been able to communicate to you, have, have they been more forthcoming? Are they communicating with you enough? Um, I think it's an ongoing investigation. I think at the end of the day, I'm not an investigator. Mm -hmm. um, do I want more information? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but we don't know if they have do it. Do I know that they have it or do I know that they can give it to me? No. no. So, of course, I'm frustrated. Um, but I can't necessarily point that finger direct. <laughs> Based on what you've seen so far, are you confident in their investigation? I have to be. Right now. I have to be. Um, We're counting on it. And I think that um, it's, it's easy to sit back and say, oh, I would have done this. Oh, I would have done that. But I don't know what they walked into. I don't know what they've done. Um, are there definitely some things that, you know, I've, I've heard that I, I wish I, I hadn't heard about the investigation so far? Absolutely. But right now, I can't. I am frustrated that I don't have more information. But I don't know if they have information that they can give me. We don't know. We don't know. My husband... It's in contact with him every day, the FBI, Moscow, Idaho State Police, and every day he just says, nothing, babe. And I'm like, nothing? And he's like, nothing. I mean, just nothing. And I don't know if that's because they have nothing or because they're protecting the investigation. So, you know, it's hard to be mad at them if, you know, we just mm -hmm. know they're protecting the investigation. But it would be nice if they said, we have something, you know, we have a little lead or we have an idea. And... It's, it it's, just gives you a little bit of hope, you yeah. know, and, and I mean, it we, is very hopeless mm -hmm. right now, I it guess, is. being left without that information. Yeah, cause, yeah, you, you can't grieve. You can't mm -hmm. feel safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Yeah. And, and if and Kaylee and Maddie were down there right now in this situation with somebody else, they would be home. Yeah. I would have told them and they, you know, mm -hmm. I would have been you, you girls need to get home now, mm -hmm. like yesterday now. Mm -hmm. So. You know, to families, I mean, I think it's Thanksgiving weekend or is coming up and, and most kids are coming home, but there is no way. And there is no way that I would send them back until this person is found. This person, it's an isolated, targeted, you know, incident until it's not. Mm -hmm. Until this person, this person was angry. This was not just, you know, oh, he got drunk at a party and shot up a party, which I'm not putting anything down to, you know, people have lost loved ones that way. But this was a very violent, targeted mm -hmm. attack. And hearing, and hearing yesterday, hearing the coroner say that, that one person may have been killed in, in their sleep, mm -hmm. is that something that you had heard? Yeah. Um, yes. And that's hard, you know, but I guess for us that kind of just indicates, you know, premeditation, which we've been fighting since the beginning away from this term, you know, crime of passion. Crime of passion. Um, I think that that comes with a certain connotation that can lead to empathy, and so, we don't agree with that. No. So, so when you hear... So when you hear them say that someone was killed in their sleep, you think premeditation. Absolutely. I Absolutely. think it's impossible not to.
And not one, four. I mean, I don't know if all four of them were. We don't really have the details. But regardless, four people were stabbed to death. And premeditation, I, I mean... Like you said, it's you very went different. Into than house. Went into someone's house. house with a I'm knife. not saying you know weeks lead up. I'm not saying months right. lead up. You know, it literally could have been 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, but to somebody went in there. You know, this this wasn't this wasn't a kill. fight that you know the girls had said something and offhand this occurred. Uh, they they must have you know walked in on vulnerable sleeping a coward. kids. <laughs> a coward. Um, a coward. And so for for what it's worth, I want to run as far from the term of crime of passion Mm -hmm. as possible because I think it's weak and I think it allows him to hide um, and I think it gives him an out that he doesn't deserve. That he walked in and got mad and angry. They were all there together and something occurred and he got mad and, you know, wielded his weapon or whatever. No, this person snuck somehow into the house, whether it was a door, an unlocked door or an unlocked window, but he was not invited and he came in with a weapon, um, to and do to intentional kill. harm. With intention, mm-hmm. with intention. intention to kill. Intention to kill, exactly. Not and, even and, harm to kill. Yeah, and, and not just one, not two, not three, but four. four. One after another, after another, after another. And and, and again, that, that little detail about the... the I, I, it, it shows, like, there's vulnerability, right? There, there is the, the idea that there may have been defensive wounds, but at least one person didn't see it coming. Right. As far as we know. Mm-hmm. We yeah. don't know. Yeah. As far as we know. Yeah. Yeah. According to what the coroner has said. Right. In, in terms of um, somebody getting into the house, they, they mm-hmm. keep saying no sign of forced entry. Mm-hmm. Right. Do you think that this was somebody that was known to them? I think that that's kind of an impossible question. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a very popular yeah. house. As a mother, I feel like they know. I do. I've always felt that way. Yeah. Nobody has told me that anyway. Just I just feel like, yeah. I mean, this is a college yeah. town. It's a small town. I feel that. I feel the girls knew this person. Yeah. But we don't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. We don't, well, we don't. Yeah, we, don't. we absolutely don't know, that. don't know that. I just feel it in my heart that mm-hmm. that they knew the person, and I've always felt that way. I don't know why. I don't know why, but I've always said they knew him. They knew him. Mm-hmm. They knew him. Yeah. I just don't feel like this was like some rando just driving through Moscow, happened mm-hmm. to stop by their house. I will say um, they did have a keypad on their front door, uh, and it was a very popular house. So I, I know for a fact that. People who weren't necessarily roommates of the house did have that code. So no sign of forced entry doesn't necessarily mean that they were invited in. That's all I can say. And, and the people that survived were on the first floor. Um, yeah, to our knowledge. To, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then if, if they come in through the keypad, is it possible to, to bypass a room on the first floor it and is. go up to the second mm-hmm. floor and third Correct. floor? Yes. Yes. There's also a... Zana Kernodal's mom, Kara Denise Northington, is on the phone with me now. Kara, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Can I just ask you off the bat how you are getting by in this terribly sorrowful time? Uh, not, not very easily, not good. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know how big of that. <laughs> I, I can't. I can't even imagine the pain that you and your family are going through. Have the police been helpful to you, Kara, to understand some of the things they can and can't say? Uh, you know, honestly, no. Honestly, no. They haven't said anything. Um, I learn more on the news and on TV than they have said to me. Have you had a chance to talk with some of the other parents? of the other three kids who were there that night and share information amongst yourselves? Not really, honestly. Um, I've just been dealing with my family and um, we've just been absorbing this shock. Can you tell me, Kara, what you do know about this terrible night? Well, what I do know is not nearly enough. We need more answers. There is, you know, there is so much more that can be done that has not been done. And I just know that there's GPS, NASA, to find out who went into that home that night. I know that. Um, Why hasn't that been, why hasn't that been looked into? Why hasn't that been accessed? Um, 
Can I, um, right. Kara, can I ask you that the, um, there is a mysterious sort of four hour and 45 minute block of time that's unaccounted for by the police timeline. The, the police say that that your daughter, Zana, and her boyfriend, Ethan, were at the Sigma Chi house from 8 until 9 p.m., but then they don't have any information on where they were from 9 p.m. till 1.45 a.m. Do you know anything about that from either your um, information from the police or Ethan's family or anybody? Um, I may be candid in saying this, but I think that they were at a bar. And where, where do you um, get that information from? Did someone tell you that they'd gone from the Sigma Chi house uh, to a, a um, bar before they ended up home? That's why their father conveyed to me that he, that he thought that they were at the bar at that night. So, yeah, I mean, that's what college kids do on the weekend. So. But you don't know for sure that they left the Sigma Chi house, went to sure. a bar? I, okay. I don't know for sure, and, absolutely not. And have the police asked you any questions about where um, Zana might have been or if she texted you or if she had, you know, if she'd communicated with any family members in that period of time? No, the no answers whatsoever, um, whatsoever, really. I asked them, I asked the investigators when they come and spoke to me, um, they were not able to offer me any answers, none. Can I ask you, um, Zana's sister Jasmine uh, has put such a beautiful tribute to Zana on her um, Instagram. And I wonder yeah. if, if she has any additional information, just perhaps from being able to access her sister's social media or her phone. Has Jasmine been able to ascertain any other details of what, what happened that night or where Zana and Ethan were that night? No, I'm, I'm not gonna speak for Jasmine. Um, you would have to ask her that yourself, and um, she says she's going through it right now without her sister, and I'm sure if she had any answers or any, any information, she's already conveyed that to the investigator. May I ask you if um, you can confirm that Zana's room was on the second floor of the house? Yes, I can confirm that. And you know, and was I, it on? I, I do... Sorry. Um, I just had a question about the other two roommates who were there um, on the first floor, and I just wonder, you know, was it something heard, or you know, the, the the surviving roommates that were there, they had to have heard something. They had to have the dog something. I, I can help you with that um, somewhat. Uh, there is um, information from a prior tenant who lived on the first floor who said when he lived there uh, in 2019, he moved out. He said he could never hear anything on the second or third floor. If the television was playing very loudly on the second floor, he might hear it from the first floor. And I don't know if that helps you uh, to understand. The dog heard it, and the dog had to have been barking, you know? Um, I have information there as well. That I've got information there as well. Our Brian Enton spoke with the parents of Kaylee Gonzalez, and they, they have actually referred to that, and Brian's going to play that interview in a moment. But, but Bethany Funk and Dylan Mortensen on that first floor uh, may not have been able to hear anything, according to the prior tenant who said it was extremely difficult to hear because of the construction of that house. Yes. But I do want to ask you if I can, Kara, was your daughter Zana's room on the right side of the house if you're looking from the parking lot or on the, the left side across from the kitchen? Uh, I can't answer that. I can't but answer you do that know she was I on the... I, I, I never went there yet, so I, I don't know. But you know she was on the second floor. You, do you know I if she know looked she out the front of the house floor. or the back of the house? Um, I believe in the front, but I, I can't confirm. Like I said, I haven't been down to visit it yet. So I tried to go last month, but she was in class while I was down there. So. Okay, our viewers are looking at the front of the house right now, and the window that I'm referring to is on the second story in yeah. the front of the house, and that's where we are 
you know, triangulating that perhaps that's where Zana and Ethan were that night. I do want to ask you if you know whether or not Zana had a lock on her bedroom door. I believe she did. Yes. Do you know if it was a lock that was a, a code that you would punch in on the bedroom door? The, the prior tenant who used to live there said that every one of the doors in that home, all six bedrooms, were rented separately like apartments, and they all had yes. coded locks. But lots of social media pictures have shown at least one of the locks on the door across from the kitchen on the second floor. It didn't appear to have a coded lock. But do you think that Zana's room had a coded lock? Um, I believe it did. Her, her father mentioned to me that he had just went and replaced the lock the weekend before. Her, you said her father mentioned to you that they had replaced the lock? Yes, that, they, that he had, or he had fixed it or something. But yeah, he said that he had fixed it the week before. Just to make sure the it, week was, before. it was still. Yeah, yeah. So that, the, then that's the, that's the lock on her own bedroom door, not the lock to the outside of the house. That's I, I her own bedroom door's lock? I the main lock he was referring to. Um, I'm not sure. Just from him telling me that when, when we were speaking, so... But you're, you're talking about Jeff, right? Jeff Kernodal, uh, yeah. Zana's dad? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And, and he had been there just a couple weeks before working on a just lock, a but you're not before. sure what door. Just the weekend the, before, and he went to meet even parents, and, um, you know, went to check on Zana, and it was dad week at WSU for, for Jasmine, so he was over there, and they're, they're pretty close schools. Pullman and Moscow are, are fairly short distance away from each other. Did Zana's car have Arizona plates? Uh, I can't answer that. I don't know. And she used to live in Arizona, uh, though, right? She, I, believe she, I believe she got the car in Arizona, so that's highly likely, yes. Do, do you know what kind of car she was driving? I don't. I don't. And you mentioned about the roommates, uh, the surviving roommates. Have you had any opportunity to contact them? Do you or Jeff or um, Zana's sister, Jasmine, do you have their contact information? Are you able to call them to talk to them? Uh, Jasmine and Jeff are, are in contact with them, yes. They were all at the memorial today. And, yeah, yeah. And, and what, did, what did those girls, Bethany and Dylan, say to Zana's uh, dad and, and her sister about, about that morning when they woke up and came upstairs? What did they tell um, Jeff and, uh, and Jasmine? Uh, I don't know. You would have to ask them that. I, I, I'm not going to speak for anybody else. I'm sorry. Do you know, Kara, if Dylan and Bethany came upstairs and were trying to wake Zana? because they were trying to wake one of their roommates. Do you know if it was your daughter they were trying to, trying to wake? I, I don't have that answer either, I'm sorry. It's okay. And did they say that they could not get beyond a locked door and that's why they had no idea what was on the other side of the bedroom door and called in an unconscious person? Um, I believe that's right. What do you know about that? Um, that they called in an unconscious person, I know that. Um, but beyond that, I don't know. So it's, it's hard for you to understand as well why, if there was such a, a, a terrible crime that had been committed, the, the roommates might not have seen the evidence no. of that crime. Absolutely, yes. Have they told you at all, Kara, when you can retrieve your daughter's things? from that house? Not yet, no. I, I want to ask you if, you, if you can for us, Kara, about Zana. What would you like people to know about your daughter? We've seen pictures and we've seen social media, but you know her heart. What would you like everyone to know about her? Zana, if you knew Zana, you knew what a light she was to everybody she came across. She was just such a positive influence on everybody around her. I, I, 
honestly, and, and I'm not saying this because I'm her mother and biased. It's just the truth. There is nothing negative you could say about her. She was just such a good soul. And um, she cared. She deeply cared about her friends and her family. And she just, she would never hurt anybody. I don't understand who would want to do anything to any of these kids. They were all great, great kids. And they were all good, good friends, lifelong friends, even, you know, aside from Ethan. Um, and Ethan was such a great kid, too. I just, no kind of should ever go through this. It's, these kids were good kids. I, I don't want to do this. Have you I had a chance no. to speak with Ethan's parents? No, not yet. Are you it's going to have a chance to speak with them? I, I'm sure I will, yes. I do have a, another question, and that is what we are all trying to figure out what the police mean when they say they believe this was a targeted attack. They've gone back and forth about whether it was the kids inside the house or the house, and now they've really rested on the statement that they believe it's a targeted attack. They don't know if it's the kids or the home itself that was targeted, but do you have any thoughts at all about why that house might be targeted or why any of the five roommates might be targeted? Um, I do not think it was the house that was targeted. I believe wholeheartedly that it was those kids who were targeted. Um, they weren't just acquaintances. These kids were like best friends. They, they practically were family. These kids were tight-knit. They were good friends. Um, they, they were like family. They were around each other constantly. They did everything together. Um, how could it not be a planned thing? You know, how could it not have been targeted? For all four of do them. Do you know, Kara, do you know anything about Kaylee moving out? Do you know if she had already moved out of the house when this happened? Or was she in the process of moving out because she was graduating in, um, in the new year? Um, again, that's not a question for me. You may ask her family that. I'm not going to speak for her. I'm sorry. I think the the reason I um, the reason I ask is because I'm just wondering if her room was vacant, uh, if the furniture yeah. was gone. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. Right. Do you also know anything about? Did Did Zana ever say anything about problems at the campus? A, a, maybe talk of a stalker. There's been talk that maybe Kaylee had a stalker. Her dad said that Kaylee had told him. Uh, that she had a stalker or a problem with a stalker. The police haven't been able to run well, anything down, but did, did, did Zana ever say anything? Kaylee was an absolute beautiful, beautiful girl. And wouldn't it surprise me if all of the beautiful kids that we lost had stalkers, okay? They, they were all like rock stars on Instagram and all the social media. Um, they're vibrant, outgoing kids. Um, you can hardly be on social media anymore without being some kind of weird stalker. Um, so that wouldn't surprise me. I don't think that that's what it was, though. I will be honest with you. I think it's closer than that. I think it's deeper than that. I think there's, there's, I think they have information that they're not giving us, and it's real fishy. That's what I will say. When you say you think it goes deeper than that, what do you mean? I mean, I think it was somebody closer than a stalker, and I don't know who. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna specify anything like that. I'm just going to say I think that it was somebody, you know, and and I think possibly they may have trusted. Um, that's the only thing I can think of because how could something like this happen? Um, so so quickly, so quietly, so without any answer unless it was somebody super close to them you know what i mean do you think someone do you think the person who did this had been in that house before i think they knew them i think they may have even been friends with them i think it had to have been somebody close to them um to have been able to get away with it like this uh just with without you know i i just it just 
doesn't make sense. None of this makes any sense. It had to have been somebody they trusted that was, you know what I mean? I mean, somebody who knew the house well, somebody who knew them well. Kara, I cannot you tell you how... So quickly, without a train uh, I, call. I, I can't tell you just how how sorry I am for what you're going through and, and the parents of the other kids. It, I said it before, I'll say it again, it's unimaginable. Just know that there are hundreds of thousands of people across this country tonight who are um, feeling for you as well. You know, in spirit, you are not alone. There are a lot of people who care deeply for you and your family and they want justice for your daughter. I know, I know, and I thank everyone so much for that. Dana's death will not be in vain. We are going to find who did this. Oh, I will not take my final breath until this person is found and brought to justice for these kids, not just my daughter, but these kids and their families and their friends. We all deserve answers, and the person needs to be brought to justice. I wish you and your family peace of mind, um, and I hope that we can, you know, bring you answers soon, Kara. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for telling us your story tonight, and we'll continue to highlight Zana's story as well and her beautiful life, as you mentioned. It's very evident on Instagram and social media just how vibrant she was and how beautiful she was, and she made a mark on this world while she was here. Thank you so much, Kara, for being with us tonight. Can, can I say one last thing? Yes. Um, if any, there is someone out there, there is someone out there I know there is that has answers. Please, please, we all beg you, please, don't be afraid. Please, just tell somebody. We deserve that much, please. I think you're absolutely right. Someone out there knows something and uh, it behooves anybody with any small detail even to come forward and, and tell the police what you know. Nothing. It could be the smallest piece to the nothing. puzzle. Even if you think it's nothing, it is something, I promise you, it's something. Because right now we have yes. nothing. Kara Denise Northington, thank you for being with us. I think, you know, maybe we can talk again as we um, all plod through this investigation and the developments. But I do, I, I, I'll repeat it, I do wish you peace and serenity in this very difficult time. Thank you. I appreciate that. Can you first just tell me how you guys are doing? That's a tough question. It is a tough question. Um, it's not something you ever expect to hear, ever. Like the call we took from our kids um, who were there. And you just expect to outlive your kids, honestly. I don't know. We're just trying to process it. It's not a call that you think that you're going to have to speak with the funeral home directors and the FBI and have it hit national news. I mean, I don't, we're more concerned, you know, Ethan was a triplet and that's a big thing. There's a couple of things. Ethan was a triplet and that's the most important thing for us because we have these other two kids that are very impacted by this um, and they need to be lifted up and cared for. Um, and I think the other thing that's important to us is the reason why we've agreed to do this is number one, you're local. And number two, it's important for us to get Ethan's story out. We don't really want anybody else representing him. And it's hard to have people speaking on his behalf. So we think it's best for us to do this. And you did say, of course, that he was a triplet and looking through the pictures he sent, like you said, they seem to be always together. I mean, they all went, did they all go to high school and then college together also? Yeah. Elementary, yeah. high school everything college they all went to the same university yeah i mean everything we travel we play we hike we, everything we do is all of us together i mean we're a pretty tight family did you say that they were the ones that called you about this happening yeah yes and then are you guys all back together now we are mm -hmm. yeah we're in our home in northern idaho 
our summer home. We're going to be here for a couple of days just to regroup a little. Yeah. And can you just tell me a little bit about Ethan? I think I was told he was very athletic. I think he played was it basketball and tennis or basketball. Just tell me a little about his interest. What did Ethan like to do? Anything. <laughs> he played. You name anything. it, he played it, literally. Yeah. I think we just watched a thing from the university, spike ball champion, volleyball champion. I mean, right? I mean, he just literally would play and do anything. He he played club soccer for years. He was played, you know, we traveled, all of our kids are athletic and we traveled every weekend and he just, he was involved in anything. He just literally, he was, I don't know. He just loved to play everything. He did. All he loved sports. sports. I mean, our like our love language with him was sports. Like I literally watched. Um, I follow like NFL football so that I can literally have a conversation with Ethan because I could, you know, send him a text message and you know that was a, a you know, I don't know, just everything. I don't know that and country music. I mean, yeah, you know. I, he's he's funny. He literally. I, we were having trying to have a conversation really quickly about our favorite mem memory. We can't come up with one. I mean, he literally lit up every room. Every everybody. He was friend to all. Um, he just. He was an incredible human. I mean one of a kind popular i mean not that that matters but i don't know i think we believe that if you literally asked anybody in his life anybody they would tell you the same exact thing i mean i literally i just got an email from his counselor at college and he was just said i love that kid the minute i met him he literally walked in my office last week and it was just simply to say hi. He had a huge smile. The whole, like, you know, the feeling inside of the office changed just because he walked in. Mm -hmm. He always had something funny to say. That's been something we've talked a lot about. I mean, he was definitely the comedian of the three kids. Mm -hmm. He kept us all, I mean, we have the funniest videos of him. I just. He's the kind of kid that everybody wanted to be around. You know, he just, he was just a good kid. He was a good kid. That kind to all. Didn't deserve what happened. No. Oof. And didn't, um, wasn't he going to school to study? It was something to do with sports, wasn't it? Sports management, I think. Oh. I don't, I don't know the technical title of it. But yeah, I mean, that was, you know, that was, we told him he should go be a teacher and a coach. I mean, he was incredible the way he worked with kids and, he refereed youth basketball on the weekends in Mount Vernon. Um, it, you know, he, I don't know, he just he touched a lot of people. I mean, it's the amount of support that we've seen so far has been incredible. Right? Yeah. Our neighbors, our everybody, I, it's incredible. I mean, we have messages from people that just are like, I knew him and he was incredible. Our daughter knew him and all he talked about, all she talked about was how great he was. I mean, it truly, it's a huge loss. We, we, we were at parents weekend last weekend with them and Jim and I left that weekend. And as we pulled out of Moscow, we literally were like, we've done it. We, we've literally done it as parents. We've created three incredible humans that will go on and have something great to offer to this um, world. Honestly, all three of them. We literally, were, we literally had a conversation that we will no longer have to worry about these kids because we did it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people can support you guys right now. It's an interesting situation because in all of your hardships in life, you know, whatever you're going through, there's always a, like an outcome, like a, 
you, you, you get through it, right? Like, I don't know, whatever it is. This is something you wake up and you realize it's never going to go away. And, and it's, it's, it's a very different, it's a very different. 2 a.m. is a dark hour, I can tell you that. <laughs> We're all. And I guess just during this time, like I said, you guys seem very tight knit. Are you just like, what's going forward look like for you? I know that's a hard question right now. I know it seems like you guys are really there supporting each other through this. I think one of the first things that like when we got Maisie and Hunter, um, one of the first things, I mean, that came to me is that our life has literally taken a left turn. And I don't know how that's going to affect us, but we will not let this sink us or sink our kids. Because if anything, they have to go on and shine Ethan's bright light on their own. Mm -hmm. Kids, do you want us? Our kids are here watching. Do you guys have anything you want to add? Hunter, Maisie? Mm -hmm. He was their number one, and that's going to be a hard loss for both of our kids. Both Maisie and Hunter. I mean, he he was the he was kind of each of their number one. So mm -hmm. um it's it's going to be hard just for the three of them to, without him to, now that they're two, you know, we've gone from three to two and it's going to be hard for the two kids to yeah. figure out how to live life when you've spent 20 years as three, you know, and now they have to figure out how to be two yeah. and carry, you know, I don't know. It's terrible. Yeah. Uh, it's important for us. I mean, the reason we've agreed to do this is there's some misinformation out there. And that's been hard for us. And that's why we, uh, as a family, talked about it and agreed to do this, because the things that are being said are 100% not true. There's not drugs involved. There's not some weird love triangle. Ethan was just was stayed the night at his girlfriend's house, who was one of five girls who lived in the home. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just important that that people let the criminal part of it try to work itself out, and that yeah. that these kids, these these all of the kids were just really good, great kids. So I mean, the light of the school. I mean, everybody knew them. One of them, I believe, was his girlfriend was also killed. Is that correct? Yes, Zana. Yes, Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were in the same room. And I think that's all the questions I have, but I really do appreciate you guys sharing more about Ethan so we can understand more about him and share more about him with, you know, Western Washington and the community here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much.